uh, in our first session, we'll be discussing what is safe and sustainable food packaging, and more precisely, how can it be measured? I'd like to invite then on stage for the first talk, Mrs. Jane Monk. She is the Managing Director of the Food Packaging Forum Foundation. She will be giving us her vision on safe and sustainable food contact materials. Please, can you welcome Jane to the stage? Thank you. Jean-Paul, welcome. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm standing here as the Managing Director of Food Packaging Forum, but I'm representing the entire team uh, and also, importantly, our Scientific Advisory Board. Can we get a quick show of hands of those from the Scientific Advisory Board who are here this morning? Um, so this is our joint work, and thank you for that. This is a picture of our world. It's uh, taken in Switzerland. It's a beautiful world, not only in Switzerland, but everywhere on this globe. It's beautiful. And also, as a matter of fact, it's the only world that we have. But unfortunately, the way that we humans are behaving right now with our activities on this planet, we are doing a lot to destroy this beautiful world. And that is actually one of the reasons why we're gathering here today. There are many different aspects um, of this destruction of our natural resources, of our ecosystem. One of them is this, plastic pollution. I think this is our common ground here. We all are here because we think that this has to stop. This is a huge threat. It's not the only threat to our planet's health, but it's one of the big threats here. Another big threat to human health are the chemicals in food packaging. And this is the work that Food Packaging Forum has been doing for the last 11 years, to raise awareness for the fact that chemicals do migrate, they transfer from food packaging into food, and by doing so, they become a direct uh, exposure source for human ingestion of these chemicals. And this, in the technical term, is called migration. It's quite simple. Your food packaging, be it plastic, be it paper or other materials, is made up of chemicals. Um, in the case of plastic, these are synthetic, man-made chemicals, and they, under certain conditions, can transfer from the packaging into the food. So chemical migration. Of course, there are regulations to deal with this. Um, let's take a look at the legal definition uh, of food safety in the EU, which says that materials and articles shall be manufactured so that under normal or foreseeable conditions of use, they do not transfer their constituents to food in quantities which could endanger human health. Sounds great, right? Good. So that's the famous Article 3. <laughs> we will be referring to that a few times today, I think. And there's a lot to unpack there. But first of all, let's look at these technical terms, because maybe not all of you are familiar with the terms of food contact articles. So a food contact article is a really complicated way of saying food packaging, but it also means your baking tin, it also means the conveyor belt on which your bed is braked. It's everything, products that intentionally are brought into contact with food, processing equipment, tableware, and so on. Now, this innocent little yogurt cup is actually a highly, highly engineered product. It consists of many different types of materials. So in this example, you can imagine there's a plastic main body, a cup, but then the plastic has a lid, and that lid is made maybe of plastic, maybe of aluminum. If it's made of aluminum, it will be coated. There probably also are printing inks involved, maybe there's even a cardboard stabilizer on the outside and so on. So innocent little food packaging, highly engineered product, made of many, many different materials. But what we're here to talk about today are these food contact chemicals. And food contact chemicals are all kinds of chemicals which make up food contact materials and food contact articles. That's where the action is today, that's what we're focusing on today. And these chemicals, these food contact chemicals, they can be intentionally used to make the product, or they can be unintentionally added, non-intentionally added substances, the NIAS, the so-called NIAS, there can be impurities, 
or breakdown products, reaction byproducts, and so on. Everything can be in the finished food packaging, and everything of that can be relevant for human exposure if it does migrate into food. So let's go back to our legal definition here. And I've highlighted here the key points. So it says uh, they should not transfer their constituents. So now you know these are the chemicals intentionally used or non-intentionally added to food in quantities, quantities which could endanger human health. So how many chemicals are we talking about here, right? And this now really is going to be a quick recap of the work we've been doing over the last 10 years at the Food Packaging Forum. So we have put together an inventory of about 16,000 chemicals, food contact chemicals. These, again, are most of them uh, known to be used to make food contact materials. Some of them have been found to migrate. So they were not previously known that they were used to make the material. Of these, about 1,800, we have evidence from the lab studies, empirical evidence, that there is migration. So about 1,800 chemicals, we know that they do transfer from food packaging into food. That's a big number. Um, that's a lot. And if you think about the regulatory requirement, you have to establish the quantities which would endanger human health for at least 1,800 chemicals. That is not trivial work. But to make it even more complicated, experts estimate that there are up to 100,000 chemicals that are potentially transferring from food packaging into food. Now, most of those will be reaction byproducts, impurities, and so on. But legally, if we would faithfully interpret that regulation, we would have to test each and every single one of these potentially 100,000 chemicals for the quantities which do not affect human health. Very complicated feat. Just to put it into perspective, oftentimes people also talk about pesticides as a source of food contamination. And this is an overview uh, by one of our colleagues, Dr. Gregor McCombie from the uh, Food Safety Authority here in Switzerland. And he compared pesticides, where we have about 1,500 chemicals, still quite a big number, but they're very well characterized. We have toxicological studies for these. Um, and the levels, of migration, which is PPB range, or microgram per kilogram food, and compare that to food contact chemicals, where we're talking about up to 100,000 different chemicals. We're talking about three orders of magnitude higher levels in food, potentially, um, and mostly no toxicological characterization of these chemicals. So just putting that into perspective, and this is the reality today. We have uh, published, together with our Scientific Advisory Board, a very detailed analysis of the issues, of the shortcomings in the risk assessment of food contact chemicals. The sheer big number of chemicals is just one of these aspects. There are several other issues that come to that, not to forget the mixtures, because, of course, we are exposed to all of these chemicals at the same time, mixture toxicity being one of them. I think the important point that I want to make here is we do have evidence, we have good solid scientific evidence from many of our members on the Scientific Advisory Board and many other people out there that chemicals do contribute to chronic disease. And again, we published a paper on this uh, three years ago on the impacts of food contact chemicals uh, on human health. There are um, quite a few things that are clear facts, but there also are quite a few things that are not clear facts. So what are the facts? One of the facts is that we can, if we look at the global population, we can see that uh, male fertility, and in particular male sperm count, or sperm count, <laughs> uh, are, is declining. Sperm counts are declining globally and at an accelerated pace. And this in itself may not be concerning to some people, but I think there are a lot of different implications of this. Most importantly, that it is a proxy for things not being quite the way they should be in terms of health. And we can see that if we look at the chronic disease burden, this is from the um, uh, global burden of disease, um, you can see that the chronic disease burden for several chronic diseases is increasing um, and has, has been on this trajectory for the last um, uh, three decades already. Now, of course, 
we have to also acknowledge that chronic diseases are highly complex. They're multifactorial. We can have many different factors. It's genetics, it's lifestyle. But we do know that for some of these chronic diseases, chemicals do play a role. That is very, very well-founded in scientific evidence, and it's very reasonable to assume that for some of these chronic diseases, exposures to chemicals do play a role. And, of course, food packaging is not the only exposure source uh, for humans to chemicals. We have, unfortunately, many others, but food packaging, and that's the good news here, is an exposure source to chemicals that we could control. We could do a better job. Because the fact is that there are chemicals of concern, known hazardous chemicals, that are intentionally used to make food contact materials. This is from a study that we published last year, where we looked at what are the most hazardous chemicals that are legally used to make food contact materials. And this is in the EU, by the way, but it, it, it applies globally. And we found 388 chemicals that are used to make food contact materials, right? And uh, many of those, 352, are carcinogenic, mutagenic, or toxic to reproduction. Carcinogens that we use to make food packaging. We've got a whole bunch of endocrine disrupting chemicals. We've got a whole bunch of persistent chemicals in that mix. Now, I'm seeing some long faces. I'm going to make the news even a bit worse because you know what's coming now. We have evidence for at least 127 of these to migrate into food. People are ingesting known, highly hazardous chemicals on a daily basis with the food they eat. Those are the facts. So, and now, I've given you the bad news. Now I want to talk about what do we do about this, okay? So, we all want to grow old happily and healthily. And I think we also have the moral obligation to give our children and the next generation of human beings on this planet a, a life worth living. We have that obligation. So we need to get better at protecting people from exposures to hazardous chemicals in food contact materials. And in order to do that, we need to test all food contact chemicals. We can't just look at the ones that we're using intentionally. And also, we need to test for the in chronic diseases that are increasingly prevalent in the human population. And this is where our vision comes in that John Paul mentioned already. Um, this is what we've been working on with our scientific advisory board. How do we actually make food contact materials truly safe? That we can really stand behind and say these are safe. They're not just safe because they comply with regulations, but they are actually safe from a scientific point of view. And as you can imagine, that was not an easy thing to do. We worked very long and intensely on this. Um, we had to put this work away sometimes and reflect on it and bring it back up. But this is now what we've published. It came out two days ago. And basically, we, we say, uh, coming from the status quo, so this is what we're doing right now. This is how food packaging is tested right now. We have two dimensions. We, on the one hand, we have the chemical focus. And here, as you heard already, we look at chemicals that are intentionally used to make food packaging. And that's, that's the status quo. And then we have the toxicological focus. And right now, what is being done, the status quo, is that we are looking at chemicals that affect DNA, that are genotoxic, because we assume that that is a good proxy for preventing cancer. That's the status quo. Now, what we um, have seen is that cancer is a relevant disease, it's very prevalent, but it is not the most prevalent chronic disease uh, that can be caused by chemical exposures. And so, with our scientific advisory board, we came up with these six clusters of disease. All of these uh, types of diseases are increasingly prevalent in the human population, and they are associated with hazardous chemical exposures. So you have different types of cancers. But actually, most prevalent are the cardiovascular diseases worldwide, by far. Reproductive disorders, brain-related disorders, immunological disorders, huge issue. And last but not least, of growing concern, no pun intended here, metabolic diseases, obesity and diabetes. 
just trying to cheer you up a bit. It's a very, <laughs> very depressing topic. So, Okay, so coming back to our vision, what are we suggesting to do here? So instead of just looking at chemicals that are intentionally used and just looking at genotoxicity as the proxy for chronic disease, we need to look at the way chemicals can impact all of these six classes of disease, not just carcinogenicity, but also all the other clusters. And we have to look at all the chemicals that actually do migrate from food packaging, right? So it's, it's the non-intentionally added substances. Think of those one, up to 100,000 chemicals, and it's also the mixture of all of these chemicals that are migrating. So that is our vision. That's what we propose to do. And then uh, in the real world, of course, we have to still figure out um, the details of that, but this is how we envision this to, to work. Eventually, you take a finished food contact article, food packaging or processing equipment, for that matter, also of concern. Um, you do a migration test, and then you have a high-throughput um, screening uh, protocol looking at different assays, we call them, biological tests that you would do. Um, that are relevant for these six clusters of disease. And then also not to forget, you need to do a chemical analysis to figure out which are the chemicals that have the activity. Hopefully you could then reformulate if you do find some activity and, and run the test again until you have uh, food packaging that doesn't have any indicators of these hazards. Now there's different approaches to identifying um, chemical hazard, the classical toxicological approach would ask here, does a chemical cause cancer? And here you do a really bottom-up kind of approach. You take a chemical, you take, unfortunately, a whole uh, animal, like a rat, for example, or a mouse. You, exp you feed that mouse with the chemical and you watch it. And over a certain time, if it develops tumors, you know, okay, that chemical is a carcinogen. That takes a lot of time. And it's really also not, you know, the, in our society, people don't want to have these types of animal tests anymore, and I think rightly so. So this sort of become a new push towards alternative approaches and these adverse outcome pathways. Um, this is a concept where you uh, try to identify the, on a molecular level how does a chemical interact with biological targets in a cell. It's very, very mechanistic, but again, this approach is very, very time-consuming because, believe it or not, biology is incredibly complicated. And maybe for those of you who are not uh, deep into this topic, you, you can't relate to that, but we, after studying cancer for 60, 70, 80 years, we still don't fully understand how cancer actually develops in all cases. For some compounds, it's clear, but, but cancer is still a mystery after decades and decades of a lot of research. And so just imagine what that's like for brain-related disorders and diabetes and so on. So these are not trivial questions. So the approach that we suggest taking here is to work with the key characteristics of toxicants. And key characteristics ask a very different question. It's a very top-down approach where we ask, does a chemical have the key characteristics of carcinogens? And this concept was developed by the World Health Organization's um, IRAC, International Agency for Research on Cancer, where they took chemicals known to be carcinogens from animal studies. And these were around 100 chemicals. And then they said, what are the properties of these chemicals? What do they have in common? And so the list of the, the key characteristics of carcinogens is here. And you can see there's 10 key characteristics. One of them could be it is genotoxic. Another one is uh, it induces chronic inflammation, and so on. So we can test chemicals for these properties. Does a chemical induce chronic inflammation? Is a chemical a genotoxicant? Now, the good news is we have key characteristics for almost all of these six classes of disease that I showed you. And for the last one, I believe it's the neuro, the brain-related disorders. Um, that's in the works. That should be coming. Um, but for all the others, we do have these key characteristics now. And so the next step is to take this knowledge and develop in vitro assays that we can run high throughput to test for these key characteristics. 
And, and there's a few other steps that are left out, but <laughs> that's one of the important ones. Okay, so let's come back to our Article 3. Um, I hope I could show you that implementing this actually is not feasible right now. And I know that the EU uh, are in discussions right now for revising this regulation, and I think it's time to bring food contact material regulation into the 21st century to align it with what we know in terms of the science. And that is that low levels of chemicals migrating from food contact materials cannot be automatically assumed to be safe. And I really do hope that Article 3 will be revised to reflect that. Further, I know I'm running out of time, um, it's important also to talk about sustainability, and we'll hear more about that later today. But to quote my friend and board member, Pete Myers, if a product is not safe, it's not sustainable. I think that's also, it sounds so trivial, but that is something that we need to talk much more about. And right now, if you ask people what is sustainable food packaging, most answers you will get is, oh, it's recycled. It's, it's recyclable, right? So that is really, we will hear more about that. But that's really important. Recyclable does not automatically mean sustainable, okay? If you go home with one thing, then please remember that. Um, of course, we talked about what is fully sustainable food packaging at the Food Packaging Forum, and this is uh, what we came up with. Sustainable food packaging enables circular and fair business models that deliver nutritious, safe, and culturally appropriate foodstuffs to people. And there are no adverse impacts that destabilize the planet's ecosystem in the long term across the food packaging's entire life cycle. So you have to look from cradle to grave. Only then uh, you can say it's sustainable. Last but not least, and I can't stress this enough, with all the health costs that are exploding, um, not to mention the pain that uh, disease causes to people, sustainable food packaging internalizes all the costs, including those um, to people uh, and to planet. So maybe now you're thinking, okay, this is crazy, okay? <laughs> this is like, okay, it's a vision, right? It's a vision. I think this is where we should be headed. We can talk about that. And maybe you're thinking, now, how do we implement that? We've got certain realities. We've got our food system. We have business models and so on. People need to have food. We need food packaging. All of that is clear. But I wanted to have this day today that we can really <coughs> indulge the vision and not talk about what is feasible, but what would be enough. And this is actually a dilemma that we often find, that we say, okay, this would be great to do, but it's not feasible. And, and this is a graph that I love uh, from Thomas Homer Dixon's book, Commanding Hope. It's a wonderful book, especially if you feel despair over all this complexity and all these details. There's a tension between what is feasible but not enough and what is enough but not feasible. But I think that's exactly where we kick into action. That's where our space is here. Creativity, imagination. How do we make the what is feasible but not enough feasible and enough? So we need to collaborate. We need to know the science. And we need to be creative. And in that spirit, I would like to thank you for being here today. Thank you for listening to um, all of this. Um, and thank you for helping me on this mission, on this vision of keeping our world the beautiful place it is today and that it should be for the next generations. You can see some of the next generations sitting there. <laughs> Those are my kids. Um, I, hope, I hope that all our children and the future generations will have a life that is worth living on this beautiful planet. Thank you for helping me with that. Thanks to our SAB Vision and the team and thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Well, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. And it's nice. I mean, you, you sometimes you start your talks by saying, you know, you might you might come out of this feeling a bit despaired, uh, and it's true that sometimes, you know, it's it's a bit. I did a bit, crack a joke. But right? yeah, absolutely. And you finish with a with a hopeful picture always. So that's so that's good. Do we have any questions for Jane on the vision that she's that she's presented? No, I I, I just maybe have one thing because you mentioned pesticides. 
Yeah. Right? And I would say pesticides, in terms of the public debate, that's quite hotly debated. People are quite conscious of the potential impacts of pesticides. What you're talking about, let's say in terms of the public debate, would probably be considered a little bit more fringe compared to pesticides today. That would be my assumption. Um, do you think it has something to do with the fact that when we're talking about pesticides, there's also the issue of the direct exposure of, let's say, farmers to pesticides? And is there something similar in food contact materials when it comes to direct exposure, more in terms then of maybe manufacturing or things like that? Yeah. Is there maybe more telling, possibly, and might make it less fringe in the end? <laughs> well, I, I think it's occupational exposure, yeah, mm -hmm. that, you, that you're talking about. And, of course, those kind of studies are really important when we're looking at uh, impacts on human health because there usually we have controlled populations. Uh, wh when you do a study like that, you always need to have a, a comparison group, people who are not exposed. And that's part of the difficulty uh, with food packaging because we're all <laughs> exposed to it. Um, but if you look at occupational settings, you will, you will get smaller populations that have probably higher exposures. But still, it, 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 is, it is very challenging. And I think at the end of the day, what we also shouldn't forget is that if you have an entire population exposed even to low levels of carcinogens, um, you, you could get so much out of preventing even that low level of exposure because it's so many people that are exposed to it. So that's called the prevention paradox. So potentially you could prevent many, many more cases of cancer by reducing even the low level of exposures. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, that brings <laughs> an interesting element on not being able to single out a group. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a fair one. There's also a question here in the, in the, um, in the swap card. So um, what about using QSAR for QSAR? screening the tox properties <coughs> of the chemicals? That's a good question. So for those who don't know what QSAR, I yeah, take like it. Like me. You know, yeah. It's a quantitative structure activity relationship. And it's a, basically a computational tool uh, where you take data from the lab and you say, okay, these 500 or 5,000 chemicals, ideally large number, have these and these activities on biological endpoints, right? And from those data, you can build a model. And then you can extrapolate. You can take a chemical for which you don't have empirical data and you can fit it run your model and see, okay, this is maybe how it would interfere uh, with the bio biological system. Some QSARs um, work quite well, others are very challenging. So I think it's a, there's a lot of potential in there, but I would not swap out actual in vitro testing for in silico. Um, because the, the golden rule of these computational tools always is garbage in, garbage out. So you really want to make sure you've got very robust data that you build your model on. Uh, and we're a few decades away from, from having high scientific center, uh, certainty for these in silico tools. Okay, thank you so much, Jane. Warm round of applause for, for Jane. Thank you. So